Mr. Mays? Present. Here. Ms. Poplar? Present. Mr. Nolden? Mr. Freeman? Present. Mr. Davis? Here. Mr. Neely? Present. Ms. Galloway? Present. Ms. Van Buren? Here. Mr. Kincaid? Here. Thank you. Could, could you please all rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? I'm going to have Councilman Freeman lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance and remain standing for a moment of silence. Councilwoman Poplar has requested one. Thank you. And Mr. Mays has a request for a moment of silence. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Mr. President. I'm asking for a moment of silence for Ms. Mia Avery and her family. She's a constituent and so is her son. Her son was in a tragic car accident over the weekend at Carpenter and Dort Highway. And I'm also asking for your prayers for her daughter and her granddaughter who was also in this car. These are my neighbors that live across the street from me. So I'm asking a moment of silence and your continual prayers with this family. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Mays, do you have one? Yeah, I would ask for um, a moment of silence and prayers for Mr. Elmo White. He stayed on Graceline in the first ward. I first heard about it. Mr. Billings called me. A lot of people seen it on the news. He was out shoveling snow. and. Um, my heart is heavy, and uh, I ask for a moment of silence for Mr. Elmo White, West Graceline, First Ward. Thank you. And Councilperson Galloway? And I'm asking for a moment of silence for um, Harry and Patricia Prince. Their daughter, Vicki Prince, was um, killed the other night, and so if we could just keep them in our prayers. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Okay, we, um, we have a couple of special orders this evening. Before we get into the regular agenda, Madam Clerk, do you want to uh, do the special orders? Yes, uh, the first special order is to allow for a review of the 2012-2013 City of Flint budget, I'm sorry, audit, as presented by City of Flint Finance Director Gerald Ambrose. Mr. Ambrose. Thank, Thank you, you, Jerry. Thank you, uh, Mr. President, Council Members, Clerk. Um, for many years, the firm of Plant Moran has conducted the uh, City of Flint's annual audit. They're here tonight to give you a brief review. Uh, for those in the audience or watching, I would say that the, the audit, as well as the presentation that you'll, be, you'll see tonight, will be online in the City of Flint's website. So with that, I would just like to uh, introduce Tad Harburn, who's the partner for Plant Moran, who will introduce the team and give a brief review. Thank you. Um, I have with me Pam Hill, who's the senior manager in charge of the engagement, and also Amanda Cronk the in charge who does all the work <laughs> she did a nice job but we did uh, present the, in details to the council uh, uh, in the previous meeting uh, we're going to just basically cover some brief highlights um, what you'll note and Jerry did indicate that the comprehensive annual financial report or the audit is on the state's website at this point as long as well as any other communications that were issued as part of the audit um, and so at this point in time, we did issue uh, an unmodified opinion that basically indicates that the comprehensive annual financial report, as presented, is free from material misstatement in accordance with general accepted accounting principles. We also did issue another letter, uh, a report on the con internal control, and those items can be viewed on the state website as well. Uh, with that, I'd like to have Pam come up and just cover a, a few brief slides uh, and then we'll uh, turn it back over to the regular council meeting okay thanks Tad good evening just wanted to touch briefly on a few highlights from the city's audit for June 
fiscal year ended June 30th, 2013. We, we do have some slides up here. We did want to touch briefly on the first is related to your property taxes. So as the city is aware and the council is aware, property tax revenues make up about 20% of your total expend or revenues for the city. And because this is such a significant revenue source, we did want to just highlight the timing of property taxes when it is assessed to a resident or a business and when it becomes revenue for the city. As you can see on the slide, for the budget year ended June 30th, 2014, which is the year that you're currently in, that is based on assessments of properties based on 1231-12. Based on that date, the city saw an additional 18.1% decrease in the total taxable value of the city. And as you can see, from budget year 2010 through budget year 2014, the city's taxable value has decreased approximately 50%. So what that means is a decrease of about 50% in revenues for property taxes to the city if you were to keep the millage rates the same. So as you'll see, I think some communities in Genesee County are starting to see a return and their values start to turn and go up. As evidenced by the latest assessment, City of Flint is not seeing those numbers yet. And so it's very important to keep that in mind as you're budgeting in the future and what that means for you in the future. The other important factor to keep in mind is the effect that Proposal A and Headley has on the increases in the future. So when the city of Flint's residents and businesses start to see their taxable values increase, for example, if a resident sees a 15% increase in their fair market value of their home, the city will not see a 15% increase in their revenues. And this is due to the caps that Proposal A and Headley have put on the city's ability to tax. And so when a resident sees a 15% increase in the fair market value of their home, they will only see the lesser of 5% or inflation as far as an increase in their actual tax bill. And so what that means for the city is reduced revenues and even when values do start to turn around, it will be important to remember that you are still going to be capped at the lesser of 5% or inflation, which really will probably be inflation for quite a while because inflation has not been over 5% in a long time. So it's going to take a very, very long time for the city's taxable value and tax base to grow back to where it was back in, in fiscal year 2010's budget. So it's very important as you're doing future year budgets and forecasting to keep Proposal A and the lag between revenues and assessment dates in mind as you're going forward. We did want to highlight briefly to the governmental fund revenues and the governmental ex fund expenditures. We wanted to compare 2000 and fiscal year 2013 to five, six years ago in fiscal year 2007, just so you can see what the city has been doing in the last few years in order to try to maximize revenue sources and to cut expenditures to try to get out of the structural deficit that the city is currently in. And so this graph, I think, does a very good job to highlight the fact that the city has been aggressively trying to go after various revenue sources in order to maintain the same, same level of services that they have been able to provide to residents. The, a few highlights would be your property tax revenues. So you'll see that that's decreased about $6 million over the last six years. You might be saying, well, it, it hasn't decreased by 50% like you just talked about with the taxable value, but that's because you did have a new public safety millage, which is part of your revenues in 2013. Minus that millage, your property tax revenues would be down about 50%. Instead, they're only down about 26%. Again, income taxes are down about $4 million. State revenue sharing is down about $5 million. And really, the, the biggest reason that the city has been able to see this increase in revenues over this time frame <coughs> is due to the fact that the city has aggressively looked for federal grant revenues and way to subsidize the current levels of service that you are receiving. The biggest would be the safer grant that the city receives for fire services and emergency services, and then also some um, HUD monies that you receive in various other grants. And just to put it in perspective how much work the city has done in this grant area, in 2007, the city had approximately 15 grants 
and in 2013 the city was receiving over 30 grants. Next is a recap on the governmental fund expenditures, again comparing 2007 to 2013. You'll notice that there's approximately a 13% overall decrease in expenditures over that time frame. I'm not going to go into the details of all of these um, different functions of the city, but the majority of the decreases are concessions by unions, decreases in positions, empty positions that have not been full filled. Um, also, various you'll see some expenses increases increasing. That's mainly due to grant revenue that's been used to offset some of those expenses. And then you have had decreases in benefits and how much the city is paying versus how much the employees are paying. And I, I did want to point out public safety. So public safety has decreased approximately 10% in expenditures over this time frame, even though you've had a 50% decrease in property tax revenues from your general operating mill in that time frame. So I think it's important to, to make note that the city has tried to come up with creative and aggressive ways to try to continue to keep levels of service even though the revenues have been reduced drastically for property tax revenues and state shared revenues. So kind of to sum it all up, this is, and this isn't in a graph format but can be seen in your financial statements, at the end of fiscal year 2013, the city's general fund deficit was approximately $12.9 million. At the end of last fiscal year, that deficit was approximately $19.1 million. So the city did make strides this year to decrease the deficit by approximately $6 million. Now that was due to a lot of various reasons. There was a one-time a one revenue source of about a million dollars from Consumers Energy. They went back and did a look back study on some of the things that they were charging the city for. And so there was a refund there. That revenue will not be there on a go forward basis. Also, there was cuts to retiree health care costs where the retirees were paying more of their, their health care than what they had in the past. That resulted in several million dollars of savings in the general fund. As you are aware, that ruling was not upheld by the Court of Appeals, so the city will need to look at that for the current fiscal year that you're in, fiscal year 14, and then also on a go forward basis and what do those, what does that appeal court ruling, how does that affect the city on a go forward basis. Also there has been some layoffs and there's been a really strong push by management and department heads to really contain their costs and to watch their budget as well as capital items being put off until future years. And so we know at some point you will have to replace those capital items. And so that's kind of just a quick snapshot of the general fund for the end of the, for, for the whole fiscal year 13 and where it ended up. And I, that was really all we had planned to go over. I know we spent quite a bit of time before this going over a lot more detail with the council, but we'd be happy to go into any more detail that that um, Mr. Kincaid would like or any of the other council members at this time. The, the only thing I'd like for you to make the point that the audit was completed on time and filed at the state yep. and it was filed at the state on time this year, is that correct? Yes, it was filed before the deadline, um, which was December 31st, but it was filed around December 20th this year. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Councilman Freeman? Yeah, I made a motion that we uh, accept the audit. Present. It's been moved and supported to receive and file the audit. Discussion? Yeah, Mr. President. Mr. Mays? Yeah, when I heard you ask the question, had it been filed on time, I did see in state law that it has to be filed within six months, and that six months would have been December 31st. Mm -hmm. And so if it's been filed and received on time, clarify what we're doing now after the fact. We're receiving and filing the audit for the city of Flint. Okay, so it's a normal procedure that we do that after, after the fact. After the state has received it and reviewed it, yes. Okay. This is normal. All right, thank you. Okay, it's been moved and supported to receive and file. Roll, Madam Clerk. Mr. Mays? Yes. Ms. Pablo? Yes. 
Mr. Nolden? Yes. Mr. Freeman? Yes. Mr. Davis? Yes. Mr. Neely? Yes. Ms. Galloway? Yes. Ms. Van Buren? Yes. Mr. Kincaid? Yes. The vote is nine yes, zero no to receive and file the audit. Thank you very much. You. Mr. President. Mr. Mays? Yeah, Mr. President, if I may, I noticed that there's a special order update by emergency manager, um, Mr. Darnell Early, and that's a special order. And if I may, I'm going to try to probably ask that we suspend the rules or put it in a formal motion because unless Mr. Early or the council objects, I'm hoping that Mr. Early will attend this meeting and hear what some of the public has to say. And so what I'm trying to get at is this. Whether it's the mayor, Mr. Early, or whatever, this meeting was scheduled to start at 5.30. The public was here. They're here now, and I know for a fact that some of the public want Mr. Early to hear what, he had, what they have to say. I don't know how long this special order will last. Maybe Mr. Early or you or somebody could shed light on it for me. If it's not going to last long and inconvenience the public or Mr. Early don't mind, I really have an inkling and, in you know, it's in my mind and heart for the public to be heard first. Mr. Early hears some of what, what the public got to say, and then we proceed with the special order. Now, if um, I can put it in the form of a motion to suspend the rules and do it that way, I'll see if it is it's a second or di informal discussion, or even Mr. Early, maybe he'll give the courtesy to the public. But that's what I'm hoping can happen here today. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Early, special order. I'm sorry? I was unsure. Was that in the motion or was that Mr. Early extending courtesy to the public? Mr. Mays made a motion for us to suspend the public or the uh, special order until the end of the meeting so that Mr. Early would have to stay here and uh, tell the public. No. I don't believe. Mr. Mr. President, I also extended the courtesy to Mr. Early to. Um, agreed to that so he could hear the public, or I also said that he could give us an idea how long it would take. I'm just trying to be courteous to the public first and foremost with an, wanting Mr. Early to hear them, and I'm trying to be, you know, courteous to the decorum of this council meeting as well. So when he got up, I don't know if he was going to get up to agree or shed some light. But, yeah, I did put a motion on the floor, but my colleagues have been courteous, and I think we're being courteous. So if the motion can stand until we hear what Mr. Early say, um, then I think we could know from my colleagues whether it would get a support. Well, the special order is for Mr. Early to give us an, uh, an update on his um, plan that he has submitted or is about to submit to the state. Has been and if he wants to respond um, to, to your request to stay to the end of the meeting, I don't think he's planning on leaving until the meeting's over. But um, at this time, the special order is for Mr. Early to give us an update on his plan. But so. Mr. President, point of order, in fact, there's a motion on the floor. And in fact, the order of business would be to entertain a second Based on what you said, I know that I've got to say point of order. There's a motion on the floor. Okay, there's a motion on the, on the floor. Is there support for it? Oh, Mr. Daly? I'm sorry. There's, there's a motion on the floor. Right, but I wanted to say the question. I don't think the question was answered. Were you planning on staying after the special order? Were you planning on? Were you planning on staying after? Uh, the special, the special order after you present your information to the council, or will you? Mr. President and to the members of the council, it was my plan to take about 20 minutes and run through the items under the special order, and I had every intention of being here until the meeting concluded. Okay. I, I would accept that. Okay. So. Mr. President, if I may, and this would lay that to rest, but Mr. Early, do you mind whether the public go first? Through you, Mr. President, to Mr. Early, do you really mind? Well, I want to get the reports out. I want to take care of that business. And then 
whatever uh, the remainder of the agenda uh, should pretty much stay intact the way that it is. Mr. President, I withdraw my motion. Thank you. Mr. Early, on the special order, um, you, you may proceed and give us an update um, on your report. Thank you, Mr. President, and to the members of the City Council. There are obviously a number of items that have transpired since your last meeting as a council, and certainly uh, some that have happened as recently as the last couple of weeks. And I would like to call Mr. Uh, uh, Ambrose and Mr. Bay, the attorney, forward to talk a little bit about uh, the issue of the Sixth Court of Appeals ruling on retiree health care. And those of you who heard the detail of the auditor's presentation know how important this issue is to our ongoing uh, solvency in the city of Flint. And so I would like for the city attorney to just give you a brief uh, discussion on where we're headed with that and following him, uh, the finance director, to talk a little bit financially about what that impact potentially has on the city. This case is called Welch v. City of Flint. It's a case that's pending in the federal district court in Detroit before Judge Ternow. Um, it is a case that was brought by a group of retirees. Uh, as you may recall, uh, emergency manager Mike Brown issued a number of orders that modified health care benefits to existing employees and to retirees. Uh, union contracts were amended. A, a number of things happened to modify uh, health care benefits that the cities offered due to the financial emergency. Uh, this group of retirees filed a federal lawsuit seeking to stop those changes. At the very beginning of the lawsuit, they filed a motion for an injunction. An injunction is asking the court to stop the uh, modifications during the pendency while the case is going on. Uh, the district court in Detroit granted that motion, so the judge in Detroit stopped the city from implementing those changes. The city filed an appeal to the Sixth Circuit U.S. Court of Appeals uh, in Cincinnati, and that court issued a stay, meaning the injunction was stopped. That occurred in June of 2013. So since June of 2013, uh, the city was permitted to make the changes to the retiree health care benefits. On January 3, 2014, the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals issued an opinion uh, and, and held uh, that the, um, the federal district court's injunction should be reinstated, meaning this, that the injunction against the city for making the changes to the retiree health care benefits uh, was uh, reinstated. Um, it is important to understand a couple of things about that. First is that the case is still going on. Uh, we will be in litigation probably for some time. Uh, this injunction came at the very start of the case. Um, the, the question at its core is whether modifying those health care benefits were reasonable and necessary to remedy severe economic problems facing the city, whether that, that change was reasonable and necessary. The federal district judge uh, concluded in granting the injunction that the city hadn't fully proven its case under the law. The city still has that opportunity. In fact, the Sixth Circuit uh, Court of Appeals specifically said, and I'm quoting, additional fact finding may illuminate whether the orders were indeed appropriate under the circumstances of this case. Uh, Mr. Ambrose can do a much be better job than me of explaining why we think uh, those modifications were certainly uh, necessary and appropriate, uh, and the audit definitely speaks to that uh, issue. Thank you. <coughs> Mr. President, council members, the court ruling is a significant setback for the city of Flint as it works to regain long-term financial solvency. As we know, the city has been in state receivership this for the second time since December of 2011. At the end of FY12, the city faced a $19 million deficit in its general fund and had minimal cash flow. According to a recent study from Michigan State University, it was also a city with one of the highest amounts of unfunded pension and health care costs per capita, nearly $11,000 per resident as of 2011. Reducing the deficit and restoring a balanced budget has been extremely difficult. 
and its results by, by no definition are fair to anybody, to taxpayers, employees, or retirees, those receiving city services. You will recall that the process of balancing the FY13 budget started with a projected $25 million gap between revenues and expenses. And even that preliminary estimate turned out to be smaller than what actually had to be done. Returning the city to financial solvency cannot be achieved without reducing expenses, increasing revenues, or doing some of both. The process of balancing the FY13 budget affected residents and other taxpayers, employees and retirees, plus the visitors and the students who are affected by city services. Residents saw a 25% increase in their water and sewer rates, a six mil increase in property taxes, a new assessment for street lighting, and increases in fees while seeing city services reduced. Employees saw a 20% reduction in the workforce, including more than 80 layoffs, and also saw a 20% reduction in compensation costs. Retiree health care and a new pension structure was impl were implemented for new employees. And retirees also saw a change in their health care benefits as they were moved into the same health care plans as active employees, if pre-65, pre and into Medicare Advantage plans if they were on Medicare. The major changes included a $1,000 deductible for single subscribers and a 20% co-insurance. Depending on the choice of plans, some retirees could also be, would also be subject to a $61 per month premium share. These changes for some 1,900 retirees was projected to save about $3.5 million annually. Residents, businesses, visitors, and students all, saw, all continue to see the impact of a city government that's barely able to provide basic services. Police and fire staffing are minimal, as evidenced by long wait times for police response. Road maintenance and support is minimal and slow, as most recently, as most recently apparent in the recent winter weather. Parks are vacant. Our 63 parks are vacant and unused with very infrequent mowing. But the city was making progress. The FY13 budget was balanced and ended the year in a favorable position. But a $13 million deficit still remains. The FY14 budget was cautiously on target with expenses not, expect not, exceeded, not expected to exceed revenues at year's end. And the FY14 budget included an anticipation of further reducing the deficit by at least another million dollars. Reinstituting the historical levels of health care for retirees could potentially add more than $400,000 per month or nearly $5 million annually to city expenses. Reimbursing retirees for their expenses back to the date of the court's ruling will require budgeting additional funds in the FY14 budget and it certainly will impact the preparation of the FY15 budget. Additionally, and very significantly, the city's unfunded costs for retiree health care will rise to near previous levels. The city's action as part of the FY13 budget development to restructure health care for active employees and retirees reduced its unfunded liability of nearly $900 million to less than $350 million. Reversing this action for retirees is likely to increase the lowered amount by several hundred million dollars. With property values still stagnant and major grant sources uncertain, revenue and expense projections for the city of Flint show a continuing structural deficit of several million dollars annually. In other words, the amount of revenues anticipated to, to be received each year is projected to be several million dollars less than the expenses necessary to even continue the current minimal level of services. So the lawsuit ultimately be decided in the plaintiff's favor, the projected structural deficit grows significantly, wiping out most of the progress made to date in restoring the city of Flint to long-term solvency. Without the ability to contain one of the biggest cost elements in the city government, that's retiree health care, it will become necessary to consider all of the options that may be available uh, to the city and to the emergency manager under PA 436, and that may include bankruptcy. And as we know from experiences in other troubled municipalities, the option of bankruptcy may have far-reaching consequences, not only for providing retiree health care, but for pensions as well. Thank you. Mr. President, 
Mr. Early's not through with his. No, but Mr. President, if I may. I'll call on you after the special order is over. I'm going to call on council members after the special order is over. Is this another subject matter, Mr. President? Mr. Early has the floor for a special order. When he's through, I will call on council members, Mr. Mays. I'm not going to appeal the decision of the chair, but I'm just, I, when, <laughs> we are the council. And if I need to, under Robert's rules, if you talk to me like that, I'll appeal the decision of the chair. It's a relevant question that I have. And I'm not preventing you from asking that question, Mr. Yes, Mays. Yes, you I'm are. Only, I'm only stating that there's a special order. Mr. President, may I have the floor? No. Okay, I appeal the decision of the chair under Robert's rules. It's fine. Go ahead. You know how that worked, don't you? The vice president will take the floor, take the chair, and me and you will debate whether you're right or wrong. Well, it only a few get support from the council. No, it's not only if I get support. If you got a city attorney there, if you don't agree with me, and I appeal the decision of the chair under Robert's rules, it's a procedure for that. Me and you will debate the issue, and then the other, the vice chair chairs the meeting. I mean, if you want to take it there, I should told you I had something that I want to talk about. And I just said, Mr. Okay, so I appeal the decision of the chair. Okay. Do you need the city attorney to tell you what that means? Mr. Attorney? There's an existing emergency manager order that directs that you only speak when recognized by the council president, so we don't need to refer to Robert's rules. We refer to the emergency Well, that's manager. who recognized me, the chair. So I'm appealing the decision of the chair, and I think through you, Mr. President, to the city attorney, his question was not about the emergency manager order, but simply the procedure for appealing the decision of the chair. The law provides under Public Act 436 that the emergency manager can issue a directive in order to this council, which he has done. In that order, he specifically vests in the council president the ability to conduct these meetings in an efficient manner, including recognizing a member of council to speak you. And he has not recognized you, you to speak, and therefore you are not permitted to speak. So uh, under Robert's rule, you don't have to be recognized for certain orders. Do you know that, Mr. City Attorney? If certain things like point of order, um, point of um, information, and appeal of the decision of the chair, you might better check your Robert's rules book. I was the parliamentarian for UAW Local 699. You can laugh if you want, but the UAW taught me well. Rob, did the UAW teach you that Robert's Rules doesn't supersede Public Act 436 of state law? No, I, um, the state law tells me that we are acting under Robert's Rules and the council rules. The, what, what, what I know about this meeting is that the rules has not been suspended by an emergency executive order. Now, if Mr. Early want to write one suspending the charter and the rules, then he can do it now. But right now, I know Public Act 436, and there's no executive order that suspends the rules. Now, he can write one, but remember, I took you to court. So are you telling me that we can suspend the rules in the charter without an executive order? Are you telling this public body that? I'm not going to debate with you. The okay, you don't have to debate. All you should do is deal with Robert's rules. I'm appealing the decision of the chair, or Mr. Kincaid could simply let me know why we're discussing pending litigation in the public. We usually do that in an executive session, and that was my original question. I've never seen in 30 years, whether it's an emergency manager, a city attorney, or a financial officer, Mr. Kincaid, and then I'll let the meeting go. When there's a pending litigation, we usually go in the executive session, and I was just wanting to know why was this Court of Appeals case under 436 different from any other litigation that I've seen that's pending. We should have been in executive session when we heard Mr. Ambrose and or the city attorney. That was my question. So y'all proceed like you want. You can arrest me if you want, but I know law. God bless you. Mr. Early. Mr. Early, you can continue. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. President and to members of the council. What you heard from both the city attorney and the finance director is not so much a discussion of 
the uh, litigation, but you heard what the impact of the decision uh, will mean to our going forward. Our going forward, as you know, has been my attempt to further engage the council in an active role working towards a possible transition as provided in Public Act 436. Well, there are certain things that are germane to what the court decided that in my opinion, casts a serious pall over that direction. The one thing, obviously, is the financial implications. A $12 million budget deficit going forward uh, and with no ability to, uh, to uh, uh, affect, if you will, the effects of that, of that ruling means that it brings into question whether or not the city of Flint can indeed manage itself out of that uh, financial difficulty without the assistance of 436. The Transition Advisory Board will not be able to deal with the projected impact of those budget deficits that will accumulate if we are not allowed to get to that issue of the retiree health care. Now, this has all been discussed. This isn't the first time that this has come up. You all are aware of that. We've talked about it long before the ruling because when it first came up, uh, the retirees sought an injunction to prohibit it. Uh, so moving forward, for me at least, means we have to go down a path that number one, respects the ruling of the court, but number two, puts in perspective the realities of whether or not the city of Flint will be able to manage itself out of the deficit given uh, the ruling that we're dealing with. That's germane because, as I said to the uh, council president and to my executive team, which consists of the finance director, Mr. Ambrose, the city attorney, uh, attorney Bade, the, uh, the mayor, uh, the director of planning and development, also uh, the coordinator of our master planning, uh, Megan Hunter, uh, Elizabeth Murphy, the uh, uh, assistant to the emergency manager, and Howard Croft, the Director of Public Works. I introduce these people to you because they're going to be very instrumental in guiding that course given the new challenges that we, uh, we've just been, we've just been uh, given. And not only on the ruling, I mean, that's one issue. I think one of the things you heard from the auditors is that there are a myriad of issues that determine whether or not this financial solvency, which is the reason why I'm here, can be sustained over the long term. And so one of the things that I've done, as you've read, is to put together a blue ribbon team to look at governance, to look at that whole issue, to be able to put together a report on whether or not the probabilities for success in a post-436 or post-emergency manager environment has chances to succeed. Definitely the challenges by the, uh, the court ruling have added a significant burden to that challenge. But we're going to continue to move in that direction. Our meeting is, uh, the first meeting is Thursday to begin examining those issues and to begin talking about um, those things that I think in the long run are going to be very critical to where Flint comes from. One of the things about the audit, which is why I wanted you all to not only participate in the, in, in the presentation, but to get a sense of the impact so that the public can also be aware of it as it relates to the options that may be available at some point should we not be given the opportunity to uh, affect any change in that, in, that, uh, in that area. And so another thing that has, has been important as we go forward is that I've had conversations with the president of the committee, I mean of the uh, council, about committees. I think the work of the committees has to be uh, guided so that as a team with the mayor, with the administration, and with the council that we're dealing with these issues so that everybody understands the gravity of what we're talking about. And I've asked the president to appoint uh, some committees, one of which is a public safety committee, which will give the new police chief a group relative to the council or involved with the council to look at the issues and help strategize and to talk about those strategies that may go forward to address the problems of public safety, police, fire, and uh, emergency response and, and, and communications. So I'll be asking uh, the council president to do that. 
The other issue that I think is important as we go down that track where we started at the beginning of the year is that we want to revisit some of those workshops so that we can talk about the issues, so that we can talk about finance, so that you understand when we go through an audit and take a look back, that has to be germane to what we plan and strategically design for the next budget year. Well, that plan and that effort just got a lot more challenging as a result of the act, I mean the, uh, uh, the uh, appeal. And so we will be scheduling those workshops as we've talked. Uh, and I want to thank you all who signed up for the Michigan Municipal League workshop that uh, we will be uh, making sure that you're able to attend as you begin your learning experiences. So there's a lot going on. And I reported back to uh, the state some 45 days ago. My 45-day report has now become a 90-day report. And so after this first quarter, I've had an opportunity to look at the issues and the challenges. And you heard tonight from the auditors, and I'll reiterate the point again, and that is that the cost containment measures and the strategies for uh, reducing expenditures are working. The difference in the expenditures and the revenue, uh, revenues uh, has resulted in reduction of the deficit. But that's not enough. We've got to find other ways to continue to reduce that deficit. And yes, we have to find ways to manage not only the budget, but to manage the, uh, the expenditure plan according to priorities. So we'll be looking to you as a council, working with the mayor and the administration, to put together that spending plan based on priorities of the master plan, other issues, uh, and, and some of the things that I think we saw over this past week would clearly illustrate that we are lacking in the financial and human resources to provide the level of service that a city this size needs. But that's the cards that were dealt. Our plan for, for, for dealing with that is to take an orderly approach towards trying to manage this deficit. And we're only as good as that as we are as a team in terms of the council's involvement, in terms of the mayor's involvement, and in terms of the administration's involvement. So as we go forward, we're going to be looking at those things. We're going to be talking about how we get better to managing those issues. Because this is a real challenge for the city. The word bankruptcy is not as far out of the lexicon now as it may have been before. The irony of the whole thing is that the reason why we're now beginning to wonder what that means in the law and what it means to the city is because the very reason that these steps were taken was to avoid having to strategize about what bankruptcy might mean. We're not there yet. But we have to take it under consideration because it is a part of Act 436 and it is something that we have to explore in terms of what that would mean. Not whether or not to do it, but what does it mean. And that discussion will not just take place in my <coughs> office or in the mayor's office. It will take place uh, throughout the, uh, the group that I feel is going to be responsible for managing and at some point declaring whether or not uh, we can get out from under four, you can get out from <coughs> under 436 based on an ability to sustain that. <coughs> Just briefly, the financial operating plan that I submitted to the state in November uh, requires an update to the third, or rather is the third update of the finance and operating plan which was put in place before my arrival and has served as the foundation of our work. Everything that we've done to this point to restore solvency has been based on that plan. According to Public Act 436, this plan is to have the objectives of assuring that the local government is able to provide or cause to be provided governmental services essential to the public health, safety, and welfare, and assuring that financial accountability of the local government is relatively sustainable. This document that I have submitted to the state is available for viewing on the City of Flint's website on the emergency <coughs> manager page under reports. And I encourage each of you to take a look at that. Uh, if we're going to have meaningful dialogue and discussion about the future of the city. Uh, those kind of things should be second nature to you in terms of what's in them. If you've got questions about them, let me know. And between myself and my executive team, we can certainly answer the questions. But we have to start that dialogue, and that's where we have to start. Uh, I have outlined in my report the priority issues on which my team and I will be focusing. And those are, in general, stabilizing the financial future of the city, maintaining a balanced budget, 
seeking increased revenue and reducing the unfunded liabilities for those things that uh, continue to, those obligations that continue to add up. We want to reestablish Flint as one of the safest cities in Michigan, both in reality and perception, providing public safety services re focusing on reducing violent crime at a level commensurate with cities of comparable size and resources. We want to implement the blight elimination plan, manage demolitions, and enforce blight ordinances. We want to maintain access to a clean, sustainable water source, implement the steps necessary to participate in the Karagandhi Water Authority, including interim water supply plan development, disposition of current pipeline sections, city water treatment plan updates, and develop a long-term water supply backup plan. We want to complete a comprehensive water and sewer rate study, which is now about a week or two from receiving the first draft. This study is being done for the purpose of identifying the true cost of service for provision of water and sewer during the interim period of transition between Detroit water and sewerage and KWA service. This includes the period for which the water will be supplied by the Flint River, as well as looking at the capital costs for maintaining a water system. We want to implement the master plan of the city of Flint, updating the zoning ordinances, evaluating the capital investment needs, and incorporating master plan activities in the annual budget development, which was the reason why I reorganized the Department of Planning and Development and put that under Ms. Hunter's direction. We want to explore governance models for the city of Flint, establishing, as I've already done, a citizens committee to evaluate city governance models and recommend a course of action possibly for charter amendment or any actions that will be necessary to, assure, uh, to reasonably assure uh, that the city will not uh, incur a third strike in its ability to manage its finances. But according to PA 436, the next, next report to the governor and the Department of Treasury is due April the 8th of this year. The city also provides quarterly updates to Treasury. These reports are also posted on the City of Flint website. And so these documents and these actions pretty much provide the framework for our plan to continue moving Flint out of the deficit budget situation and establishing as much as we can a mechanism by which a structure <coughs> can be pointed to to suggest that this is the structure by which the city will continue to manage and as we look at a possible transition to a transition advisory board having those things in place. I expect the uh, Blue Ribbon Committee to have a report available by the end of uh, this fiscal year, which is June 30th. We'll begin that work and uh, that report will form the basis of whatever we give to a transition advisory board in hopes that we will be at a point where the council functions as the legislative body, the mayor functions as the executive body, and the administration supports the mayor and the council in doing the work of the city of Flint. That's the goal as I see it going forward in 2014. Uh, again, that challenge has been made a little bit more difficult by the ruling, uh, but we're, we're concerned about making sure that those things that we can control are under our control, and that would be good management. That would be pursuing the, uh, the, 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 the learning experiences, particularly for the new members of council, and also working together uh, to get us to that point where I can make that recommendation. And that basically, uh, Mr. Chairman, other than the request for the uh, appointment of the committees, concludes my update. Thank you, Mr. Early, and I'm um, planning on making those appointments at the end of the um after all the uh, speakers have the opportunity to speak this evening. Okay, that's fine. I did neglect one thing. I didn't neglect it, but <clears throat> as I was talking, I asked the mayor to take just a couple moments because he's a part of that. I'm representing the administration, uh, and, and you all are the legislative, and I, I wanted him to make a, a couple comments in that regard in support of moving forward in the direction that I've laid out. Mr. President, may I ask Mr. Early something before you sit down? Not right now. Mr. Mayor, you can uh, the rest the city council. Right. Well, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you for a few minutes tonight uh, to our council members, uh, council leadership and president, as well as our, our concerned citizens who are taking time to be here tonight. Uh, we may differ on a few of the details, but I believe we all agree on the goals of a safe and sustainable, as well as a democratic city. 
and we want to take steps in that regard. So uh, having had an opportunity to also review the audit, uh, listen to the previous presentation, I have a few observations of my own that I'd like to share with you. The first is that uh, we need to continue to each do all that we can as elected leaders uh, to encourage the trend of fiscal responsibility. Uh, we all know that over the years the City of Flint's faced a variety of different financial challenges, uh, some extremely severe. Uh, we're hearing about another one of those in some detail tonight. Uh, but we all need to do uh, what we can in terms of our own ideas and proposals to continue that uh, fiscal responsibility. Uh, another thing is that the, the focus on new development and implementing the master plan I think is critical. Uh, you heard from the auditors that under state law, uh, Proposal A limits the increase in existing uh, property values in terms of their taxable value to rise at inflation or 5%. Uh, one of the ways that then you add to your taxable value is to have new development come into the city because that new development is then uh, fully assessed at, at half of its uh, market value at the time that it's built. So uh, whether it's General Motors making new building uh, investments or American Pipe, uh, that adds to the tax base that we can have and depend on going forward. Uh, I also see a need to continue to look for long-term savings. Uh, we need to find things that don't just save us money uh, for one budget year. We need to find things that are going to save us money uh, long-term. And you saw that in the long-term 20-year uh, revenue and expenditure chart. Uh, we need things that are going to save us money uh, over time, not just uh, one, one at a time. The, the grants are also critical. Uh, I know that over time, council members will get more involved in that work. You saw how important those revenues are in terms of our overall ability to provide services. They may be restricted uh, to demolition or to blight, but those are the services that our community is asking us for. Uh, so having those resources, I think, is critical. The, the other item is I'd also encourage you to consider, as we work with the Michigan Municipal League, getting involved in the state policy reform work and asking for a positive partnership uh, from our state, whether that's with revenue sharing, uh, other changes with transportation dollars or housing funds. Uh, we're going to have to uh, see some changes at the state level. Uh, the status quo is not going to help us achieve the stability uh, that we know that we want. I had an opportunity earlier today to meet with Mayor Lansing, uh, uh, Mayor Bernero and Lansing, uh, Mayor Hopewell in Kalamazoo and some others. You, from a distance, those cities may uh, look more healthy in terms of their budgets, but they're very concerned about the long-term uh, viability of their governmental structures uh, given what's happening with the state policy and how property values are interacting with state law. So uh, I'd encourage you to be a part of those discussions. Uh, it's going to take some serious courage and some serious creativity for us to deal with this challenge. I think that's what we can all continue to work on over the next few months, and I look forward to the opportunity to work with you through the new committees that will be established, uh, hear from the public comments tonight, and, and see how quickly we can get to that uh, democratic city that's one of our goals. So thank you for the time. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Anything else, Mr. Early? Okay, thank you. Are there any uh, petitions or unofficial communications, Madam Clerk? No, Mr. President. Are there any communications from other city officials, Madam Clerk? Not at this time. Okay, that brings us to the public speaking portion of our meeting. Mr. President. <laughs> Mr. Mays. Yeah, Mr. President, we started this meeting. We've heard Mr. Early, thank you for giving me the floor. We heard Mr. Early talk about meaningful dialogue or orderly approach, working as a team, and then we heard the mayor say democratic. I know what all of those things mean, but it's been demonstrated here thus far that we're not having meaningful dialogue. It's not an orderly approach as it relates to Robert's Rules of Order, and we ain't working as a team because I've been separated for some reason, and that's not democratic. So what I'm trying to say to you is this. When I asked to speak to Mr. Early, I asked Mr. Brown this under oath. And I want to hear what Mr. Early say, whether he's under oath or not under oath, because this is the real city council. We can ask Ms. Brown to put people under oath, because in Detroit, when Kwame Kilpatrick committed perjury under oath, 
it came back to haunt him. And so believe me, under the charter that I know, which is an orderly fashion, Robert's Rules, which is orderly fashion, I'm taking his words, and working as a team. I had a simple question, and I thought you should have respected me, and I wanted to ask him, is the charter in effect? Is council rules in effect? Because if I can't communicate under Robert's rules in an orderly fashion, as a team player, meaningful dialogue, in a democratic way, then guess what? What have we got? So believe me, sir, you gave me the floor. I appreciate it. I'm a well-educated college graduate of Michigan State University who don't like being made a fool of in front of the public. And I'm here to ask the question, are we operating under the charter of any sort? Are we operating under Robert's rules? And if so, then I want to continue to know that I'm taking an orderly approach, working as a team, meaningful dialogue in a democratic society. And so that's the question I want to ask him when you didn't allow me, because maybe you think I don't know how to take an orderly approach, work as a team, meaningful dialogue in a democratic society. Thank you. Are we working under the charter in Robert's Roof? Yes, no. We are operating under Public, Public Act 436, which supersedes the charter. Since we are a political subdivision of the state of Michigan, that statute empowers the emergency manager to delegate specific responsibilities to the city council, which he has done. Yes, he did. And he did that under emergency manager order number two. Emergency manager order number two was enacted by and signed by Mr. Kurtz. And then when Mr. Early came on under emergency manager order number two, he reaffirmed it. And when he reaffirmed it, he had all of us sign. I signed on November 22nd. So I know what Public Act 436 say, um, Mr. Peter Bay. And I'm here to tell you, under emergency manager order number two, it says that we meet once a month, and the purpose that we meet is to hear public comment. And then it says also that if he puts something else on the agenda, he can do that. But it does not say that we're not working under the charter and under Robert's rules. And it does not suspend our council rules. So you can keep saying Public Act 436. Public Act 436 worked like Public Act 4. It operates under executive orders. He issues executive orders. And this executive order, emergency manager number two. So if you quit sidestepping the question, we all know what Public Act 436 say. The Court of Appeals just told y'all and what you've been talking about, that Public Act 436 didn't give y'all the power what it did, you thought it did, for them retirees. And I'm telling you, it might be overturned. So, okay, I concede. We under Public Act 436, and we operate under emergency manager order number two. Through you, Mr. President, to the city attorney, the question is, are we also working under Robert's rules and or the um, rules of the city council and part of the charter. Well, you sort of pick and choose the orders you subscribe to because after the first meeting, after two repeated interruptions, after a totally inefficient council meeting that kept the public here for hours unnecessarily, the emergency manager issued an order specifically directed to you empowering the, the president of city council to control these meetings so the folks that spend their time to come down here and attend these meetings aren't put through endless speeches. Point of order, Mr. President. That's an answer to the question. Answer answer to the question. answering your question. So, oh, okay. so you sort of pick and choose the, yes, yes. You pick and choose the, the, the orders that you want to follow. And, and yes, during a meeting, Robert's Rules applies under, under the provisions of Public Act 436 and to the extent